Good morning, Judge. Good morning, my brother. Our scripture to today is from Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 13 to 46. And it reads as follows. Then Jesus went with them to a place called his men, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch for me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I do it, your will be done. And again he came and found the spirit, for their eyes were heavy. So I left them again. He went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest in town. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See, my return is the end. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to take this time to thank those who came here before this morning. Uh, those who were preparing us. Hear me what we hear this morning, uh, which is the word of God. So, uh, just a reminder to all of us is that uh, the world, especially Christendom, or those who believe in Christ over the world, uh, they have Jesus in their mind. I'll say from today up to maybe next week Sunday, uh, people are celebrating what's called Passover. Uh, if you go to Roman Catholic Church, and these are denominations, by the way, not churches. Uh, they, they believe that uh, today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. My dear brother Baxter alluded to that uh, when he talked about the sufferings of Jesus. That people, uh, one day, uh, they shouted, Jesus uh, says, Hallelujah, uh, who comes uh, in the name of the Lord? And just a few hours that the same people were shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. Actually, when brother Baxter was saying that, I said, Today, that's built the world celebrating that today. Uh, indeed, it is true that the Passover week uh, begins today. We as Christians who don't come together uh, to celebrate the Passover week once a year, we as Christians who celebrate Passover week every first day of the week, when we partake from the Lord's Supper, that's what we are doing. We are celebrating these six days. Which the international world is celebrating from today once a year. So, yes, we do celebrate Jesus' sufferings, uh, Jesus' death, uh, and Jesus' resurrection. We do that when we partake uh, from Lord's Supper every first day of the week. We are reminded about his suffering and death. We also thank Brother Duki for reminding us uh, that Jesus died so that we have peace. It was for peace that we have together here uh, and, and others as well, more so with God, uh, that occasionally we can live victorious lives, no matter the challenges. 
Thanks so much, Brother Duki. Thanks so much, Brother Ignatius, uh, for wonderful singing this morning. So I'd like to take to the scripture reading, my brother read that very well, uh, in Matthew 26. Just to remind each other about uh, what Jesus has gone through for us. Uh, they, they've asked me to title the sermon, I struggled a bit, but something came to my mind that the title of our sermon this morning is, What is Your Cup? What is your cup? I'm sure all of us have a cup to drink. So which one is it that's yours today? It's the same one you had yesterday, last year. It's the same one we're going to have tomorrow or days to come. The question is, as you examine your life and look at your life, let's ask yourself, what is your cup? That you may ask God and say, Father, uh, in other words, take away this cup. What is it that might be happening in your life that you may want God actually to do a miracle by just removing it so that we won't experience it? So we're going to be reminded about our cups uh, and what they might mean to all of us as we are uh, to drink them. Uh, some of them, yes, we're going to pray that God will remove them, but we'll see how it goes. Matthew 26. Uh, from verse 36. My brother read that very well. Thank you, my brother. He says that then Jesus went with his disciple to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a place to me of sorrow. It's a place of sorrow. Gets money means uh, actually it's a press olives. In other words, it's a place where olives were being pressed. I was reading some Jewish uh, literature, not long ago, I think it was Thursday night. Uh, talking about Gethsemane, uh, actually, uh, to understand that that garden, uh, it was full of olives. And I think purposefully it was planted to be a lesson to those who entered the temple. Because it was located on the east side of the temple. So anyone who used the gate east side will see the garden. And that was a very uh, famous place, a favorite place for Jesus Christ uh, to go and spend time there with his disciples. I wonder, when he takes his disciples there, what goes into Jesus' mind as you look at his disciples, because Jesus knows very well that this place where I am, which is the Garden of Gethsemane, that's where the olives, when they have ripe, then they are pressed. There were a lot of weeds there that actually press uh, those olives so they can produce oil. It's a very expensive oil, which by the way, is the same oil from olives which was used by God, maybe used by prophets to anoint the kings. So the oil which was used to anoint the kings was olive oil. So Jesus, when he goes to the garden of Gethsemane, where there is a press which is used to press the olives so that it can produce this precious oil. I wonder what goes on in his mind as you look at his disciples with no understanding. I'm sure that boy there's a place where they're going to rest, maybe they enjoy but what goes in Jesus' mind is not really resting, but all maybe thinking and agonizing about what this means to him. Jesus, as we know him, when he comes to Jerusalem, he will spend time in the other people's homes. He had no home in Jerusalem. And sometimes he will spend time in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where they will sleep, in the open garden in Gethsemane. Yes, spiritually, Jesus had a home. The temple itself, that is home. That is that his father's house it belongs to him. But the Pharisees, because they do not acknowledge him as a son of God, the one that actually is the creator of the universe, they don't see him actually as one that can claim that the temple in which they thought themselves to be the house of God is his house. And Jesus never disputed or made an argument and forced himself uh, to be allowed Maybe to spend maybe a night there. Yes, there were rooms there in the temple. There are so many rooms there where priests actually would sleep. 
So Jesus, I'm sure, if they understood who he was, they would also give him a room to sleep there. If you remember somewhere uh, in the Bible, uh, Jesus, when he entered, I think it's in uh, John chapter, chapter, chapter 2, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he went to the temple. And he found people there exchanging money, selling doves, selling goats and sheep, and, and so on. Remember that Jesus twisted the wheel and he started driving all those who were in the temple, uh, doing this kind of practices. And he said to them, Why do you make my father's house a house of robbers or a den of robbers? So even they claimed the temple to be his or to belong to his father. So Jesus, you see, he made the garden of Gethsemane his lodging, a place where he would stay if he would spend the night there. Just maybe uh, for the sake of uh, maybe knowledge, Jesus also used many times sometimes in Bethany. Bethany was not far from Jerusalem, it was about three kilometers outside Jerusalem. When you're in the Mount Olives, Gethsemane, there were mountains there. So when you climb those mountains, when you stand in the mountain, when you bend down, you see a village called Bethany. So Jesus then, when he visits Jerusalem, sometimes you will spend time there. Uh, in the house of Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and also Simon the leper. So those were his friends. So sometimes when he comes from home, which is far, that is Galilee, they will walk days and days to get to Jerusalem. Then they will go to Bethany and spend time there. And as I said in my opening, the world today celebrates uh, past, what we call Palm Sunday. Uh, if you read the book of John, actually you see that Palm Sunday, is the, the world celebrates it, starts on John chapter 12. In John, John chapter 12, we hear that Jesus and his disciples, they were in Bethany, where the banquet, the banquet, the banquet, yes, the feast in his honor somehow uh, was done. Uh, why they honoring him, uh, we are not exactly sure, but I think they honor him because of what happened in chapter 11, just a chapter before this, this one, uh, where Jesus performed one of the greatest miracles when he raised Lazarus from dead, from the dead, from the tomb. When he raised the dead man from the tomb, so after that Jesus went home, and now that he's coming to Jerusalem, and he goes to their house, they saw fit to offer him a banquet, but not knowing that actually they're preparing his suffering for his sufferings, they're preparing for his death, they're also preparing for his resurrection. They didn't know that. My brother he talked about uh, the, 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 this, this perfume uh, that people make a mix of mud and so on and so on. Uh, that produce a good, good aroma. Uh, we find that Mary actually she had such perfume, which on that day, as Jesus reclined on the table with his disciples as a guest, she poured oil on him. We remember the man called Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, protest, protest that this oil would have been preserved and be sold, and the mind and the proceeds uh, begin beginning to be poured. But Judah not understanding, Jesus says to him, he says, you know what, you always have to go. Let this man, this woman, do what she does. Actually, he says, wherever the gospel is preached, this woman will be remembered because of what she's doing today. Pouring expensive, very, very expensive perfume on his feet, on his body. So this is one of the brothers and sisters for us to remember uh, that Jesus Christ, as he comes uh, to Jerusalem, because he didn't have his own house, his own place. Actually, he called himself Bobo at one point. Uh, when one of, the, one of the people is, was working, uh, his nephew ate. I uh, may be wrong there. When the see Jesus says, uh, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, wow, that's great. But let me tell you, I'm a Bobo. But this man thought that Jesus Christ somehow had houses, he has money. All right? Jesus actually answered that his hope by saying that says birds have nests, all right, and also foxes have holes where they can run, where they can stay, where they can sleep. But he says, but the Son of Man is a hobo. The Son of Man has no place where he can lay his bird. Did that man follow him? I doubt. I doubt that we would follow him.
following him because he was not following for Jesus because of good intentions. He thought by following Jesus, I'm sure he might become uh, one of the recipients of money or maybe houses and so on. So when he heard that Jesus, I'm a hope by God to stay. I think that man went away. I don't think he continued following Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that Jesus uh, suffered so much, so much in this world for us. So as we read about Gethsemane, or something also else about Gethsemane, is that uh, when you look back at the time, uh, we find this in Ezekiel, also in Jeremiah, uh, when, 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 when God actually left the temple, I think it's in chapter 11, uh, chapter 10 of Ezekiel, uh, God actually left the temple. His spirit left the temple in the chariot. He left through the garden of Gethsemane. God left the temple because the people of God continued to use the house of God as a place where they can commit sin. They brought so many, so many idols into the temple. As a result, God summons Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, to come and destroy Jerusalem, including the house of God, this one house, which is the temple. So in order for God to make sure that this do happen, he had to leave the temple. Because with him in the temple, the Kadnesa would not have done it. Again, what we know about the temple is that inside the temple, there's a place which is called uh, the sanctuary, main sanctuary, which really was the same size as the tabernacle. So that's where in, the, in, in, in this particular in the court, there was a division, there was a cat that separated a place which is called Holy Place and a place which is called Holy of Holies to a separate by the curtain. So beyond the curtain, there was an Ark of the Covenant which was shaped in the form of more like a table. But what is interesting is that there was two sets of wings. There were wings there. Those wings represented the angels that protect God's holiness. Those wings represented the cherubims, cherubs or cherubs. Those are angels that God has made to fight these battles. These are angels that were made to protect God's possession. And if you call yourself this morning God's possession, and you need to be, because as a Christian, we have protection from God. God assigned His angel to come to an aid whenever He, whenever you are tempted, whenever you are facing difficulties. It's easy sometimes to forget that God looks. After us, it's easy sometimes to focus so much on the problem at hand and forgetting about what is the spirit. God is watching. Just like he watched his son dying on the cross at times, remember, I said, remember, my name is in this particular passage, Jesus cried out uh, in Matthew 26, saying, Elohim, Elohim, Namasabakhtani, which means, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? So, there were times where Jesus could not feel the presence of God. And most of because Jesus was carrying our sins. Jesus was made a sinner. I want to believe that one of the things that made Jesus to cry out and say, Elohi, Elohi Ramasabatani, was not much about the pain of being nailed on the cross. Maybe pain of being scourged and tortured by Pilate and also the pain that might have endured when they, they, they made him wear the crown of thorns and forced him to carry his own cross. Maybe it was not a pain much more about people actually rejecting him, denying him, even bring false witnesses. Don't be false witnesses in your life. People come for whatever reason come up and to try to authenticate some false or falsehood. So maybe the pain didn't come much of this rejection and people somehow charging him with the crime. But more so because he was made a sinner. I think the pain come more from him being made a sinner. Because as a sinner, it means that he himself needs to be saved. It means that he himself, he may not qualify to be our Savior. 
Because whoever you become a savior should be the innocent man. Someone never actually gave them to see, given to see. So Jesus is pure, as perfect, as far as from sin. He was made a sinner. Not only my sin as a one person, but the sins from Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman, up to the last person who's going to leave this world. There's been billions and billions of people in this world. Currently, they say we're about 8 billion. How many billions have lived before us? There could be billions more who are going to live after us. So Jesus was carrying the sins of all those billions of people. He was made a sinner. I think more pain than he became as a result of just that. Alright, let's move along. He says here, as, 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 as he walked the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. So he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. So, as I asked, what is your cup? Jesus knew very well what his cup was that he used to drink. Hence the Bible says, when he reached this place called Gethsemane, where normally the olives are pressed down by a wood stove to produce this precious oil, then you understand that he also, just like all the trees, all the olives, is going to be pressed down so that through him, new life can come to us. We believe in him. We have chosen to be born again. There's a brother who's been born again this morning. That's wonderful. I was talking to his father. I said, wow, this must be really wonderful. To see your son being born again. We saw him being born the first time by his wife. Now he's being born of water and spirit. He's being born of God. And that's wonderful. So we can celebrate in this national. What's his name? Nyasha. So Nyasha will be celebrating your birthday. Alright? Make sure that your parents somehow make sure they have a special meal on this day every year. Celebrating your birthday. This is an important birthday that I think as Christians we need to celebrate it. But we tend not to because that doesn't seem to be much more, much more, can be much importance in our lives. We spend so much celebrating physical birth. And we remember very well when my son, my daughter, when I was I was, I was, I was, I was born and, 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 and we do so much. But when it comes to spiritual birth, I'm sure if I start this eternity, when you baptize, you don't remember. We don't remember the day when the born of God, the day when you made a decision to forsake the world and embrace Jesus, embrace all that's important to Jesus Christ. We don't remember that day and we refuse to remember that day. That's why Satan, I think, finds his way in our lives at times because we tend to forget this day. Well, I'm not saying that we don't celebrate this day, that's up to you. Uh, I just say when you celebrate, you don't, we are not sinning. Uh, I'm just mentioning this as I'm talking to you. So, what we find is that uh, as Jesus prayed, all right, the Bible says that he began. Sorrowful and trouble. When was the last time you went to you went through life and through events and, and it just began to be sorrowful and trouble? As human beings, we need to understand it's normal in this world for us to encounter events where our souls are going to be troubled, where our hearts are going to begin to be sorrowful. So it's not something strange, which is it? supposed to happen to you. Even Jesus also went through difficulties, went through events that were actually so they had to be troubled and also begin to be sorrowful. So we too as Christians, we need to understand that if there is followers, we're going to follow soon. So don't think that something is strange when you feel uh, somehow overwhelmed by the things that happens to you in this world. Is not always predestined to happen. It's bound to happen. You are a human. We live in a world which is foreign. 
We don't live in a perfect world. The perfect world was lost in the Garden of Eden. Yes, we know that that same world which is fallen, we have regained it by being in the church. The church is the Garden of Eden, the new world. What we lost there, we gain it here spiritually. Yes. So we need to understand that we live in a very, 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 very world well, which is controlled by Satan. So if you are a Christian, you are a light in this dark well, you need to understand that Satan will never leave you alone. He will try by all means that your life becomes disorganized. Disorganize your mind, your thoughts, disorganize everything about you. That's going to happen. Because you know that you are a threat into his kingdom. You are a threat in what he's trying to do. And what Satan is trying to do is to win the world for himself. So you are disturbing him. So he's going to push you violently and you're going to fall and you're going to hurt. You're going to hurt. You'll do anything to stop you from disturbing him by standing in his way or reaching out to his people in the world. So you are standing block to him. So you're going to do anything. If for example you are a rugby player, you understand this. But actually, this is what they do in the field. Alright? It's called a contact sport. In other words, that's what we do. We are in contact sport. We are one of the rugby players in the church. We are there to make contact. First one, that we hope as a safety. We are, we, are, we, are, we are in the world where there is constantly warfare. We are always fighting. There's no time where the can say, I'm done fighting. I'm, I'm fine. I think I'm victorious. No. No. So you need to understand that just because you want a battle does not mean the war is over. The war isn't over just because you want a battle. A war for us as Christians began in the day when you're baptized, my brother Yasha. Your war began today. It's going to continue until Jesus takes you home and leave this world. That's when the war is going to end. And your war is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities. Those are demons, by the way. It's against Satan. It's against the rules of this world. That's where our warfare is. We as Christians should not be found fighting each other. We need to fight the person who is using my brother or my sister, but not my brother and sister. We need to be able to pray. For whatever is that's motivating our brother and sister, which is evil. That's what, they, that's what we find is passion. When you go to Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10, Paul tells us that we as Christians, we need to arm ourselves with God's armament. Because the day is coming where we're going to struggle. Because the day of struggle is coming, we need to always find ourselves armed with God's government. And then we need to talk about things that we need to wear as Christians. One of them, I remember correctly, this one is a belt of truth. As Christians, we should not be found without our weapon. The word of God is our soul. We need to know it. Because Satan knows this Bible more than you. He knows it. And in Matthew chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, when he tempts Jesus Christ, Satan quotes the Bible. He quotes it, but not quoting, quoting it for righteousness, but this selfish, uh, whatever, outcomes. He wants Jesus to believe that Satan is right in what he's saying. So we need to know how to use this sword of the Spirit, which is, which is the Bible. Going a little further, verse 39, Jesus fell on his face on the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It was so hard for Jesus Christ as he prayed because you know the hour has come. The hour for him to begin the process of death on the cross now has started. And it didn't start physically, it started mentally. And then also became emotional. 
We call it on, on Passover, people are celebrating that day to Friday. When Jesus declined the table in John 13, in that time, Jesus revealed three things that is going to happen to him. Number one, he reveals his betrayal. His betrayal, he says, is one thing. He said, the ones who have deep bread in my dish is what will have betrayed me. And the second one, the second thing that he reveals, he says to them, Peter, you are going to deny him three times. You are going to. Then also he just says, I'm leaving you. I'm going. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die as a result of my suffering on the cross. But remember, on the third day, I'm going to be resurrected. So those things as Jesus thinks about, they are affecting his mind. Just to think about what's going to happen to him. They are affecting his more emotions. That's why he says, just by thinking about the process we just began, he says, I'm troubled. Also he says, I'm sorrowful. He began to be sorrowful. I don't know if as a Christian, when you, when, 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 when you come across uh, some challenges, some problems, some difficulties in life, I don't know if you can listen to your mind, listen to your emotions, listen to your body, you know, the, that process of being troubled, how it begins, how it continues, somehow to increase, and, and how it makes you feel. So that's a time that Jesus, when you see that process starting in our mind, it's a time for us to begin to pray. Yes, we may ask God, as Jesus asked God, says, Father, if it is possible, remove this cup, remove this death. I don't want it. It's hard for me to imagine being arrested and being tortured, being forced to wear the crown of thorns, and being forced to carry the cross, climb my Golgotha, and when I get there, to stretch my hand and be nailed. What I'm trying to feel and maybe cover myself, he knows that when I finish this hand, I'm going to be forced to give another hand. And he knows that there's a nail that hand, as painful as it is, and also they're going to go to my feet. They're going to drive the nail on my feet. And I'm going to be left alone on the cross. Die alone on the cross. Because I've been made a sinner, though he's not. So that is about it affects him mentally. It affects him emotionally. As Jesus says, the Bible says he began to be sorrowful and also be troubled. So as he prays, he's asking his father to remove this process of saving the world, of saving you and I. He says, if there's another way that you can use to save human beings, to save people, to save you and I, he says, Father, if there's another way that doesn't involve me, use that way, use that method. If there's another method, I can't take this. But then he says, Nevertheless, not as I will, but let your will be done. If it's your will that I had to go through this for your will to be have been fulfilled, he says, let it be. In your life, are there times when things are happening, the piling up is one after another? Why are you dealing with this another one? Why are you trying to make sense of this one another one? To the point you're so overwhelmed, you just sit there and say, I'm giving up. I just don't know what I, I, I have to do. Do you pray that time say, Father, just take it away? But again, you need to remember that as much as, as we're maturing as Christians, as we pray, we need to understand and say, things have to happen. Because of his will. We are here because of him and for him. So whatever happens in our lives, we need to understand as we pray fast for God to remove whatever situation, God must say, no, it's not my way to remove it. I want you to drink it. Because it's in drinking that we grow. It's in drinking that we become wiser. It's in drinking that our faith is developed. Is in drinking whatever you're going through 
that actually can be closer to God. I hope that also the softer will come to his word and other people as well. So the drink of the cup, as hard as it is, as painful as it is, as bitter as it is, I want to believe as I read the Bible is for a good purpose at the end of the day. Only if we endure, only if we persevere, only if we allow God to use us to accomplish His will. Not my way, not somebody else's will, but for God's will. May God bless us. Amen.